economics as a science emerges from two fundamental realities about life. First, resources are limited. Second, they can be put to use for alternative uses. On one hand, it is a discipline that has a normative component into it. How should people act in order to maximize some goal? On the other hand, it is also positive in nature. How do people actually behave? These two dimensions are intertwined, since people's actual behavior is part of the environment in which other people live and are thinking about what is the best way to achieve some goal. In order to derive a theory of consumer behavior, we will start by modeling the resource constraint structure. Or in this case, we will define first the household budget constraint. Simply put, it just states that the uses of funds in consumption, bonds, and capital must be financed by sources of funds, profits from firms, labor income, and capital gains from bond and capital returns. We can express them in nominal terms or real terms. For now, we will abstract from money holdings and assume them to pay no return and be constant over time. As a remark, sources of funds did not equate the uses of funds. The constraining nature of the budget constraint just states that the uses cannot exceed the sources of funds. However, we assume that it is not optimal not to use available resources, as they can either increase your happiness from consumption or generate income for the future by the acquisition of capital or bonds. Now, the resource constraint gives us the possibilities that households have in terms of using their resources, but it does not pin down how much to consume and save every period. There is an infinite combination of consumption and saving choices over time that satisfy the budget constraint. In order to be able to pinpoint consumption and saving choices, we will make some additional assumptions about household behavior, leading to the permanent income hypothesis, a theory of consumption behavior proposed by Milton Friedman, Nobel laureate in 1976 for his contributions to consumption analysis and monetary history and theory. Let's start by looking at this table. That includes paths for income, consumption, savings, and assets. Let's also make it as simple as possible, making the interest rate equal to zero. This means that one euro saved today translates to one more euro available for consumption or saving tomorrow. Households can also borrow as long as the budget constraint is satisfied, that is, the total uses of funds equates total sources of funds. Assume also just four periods and that households enter this four-year period with no assets. So, imagine that income is 500 in 2019, 1500 in 2020, 500 in 2021, and 1500 again in 2022. The first question is, how much would you consume in each period? There are many simplifications here, but abstracting from all the complexities of the real world, I would argue that most people would distribute their income equally across periods to make sure that consumption is stable through time. Some expenses certainly suggest this to be a reasonable assumption. You wouldn't plan on spending significantly more on items like food and housing on some years than others at least not as a rule, if your average income is relatively stable. If this is the case, then I would argue that consumption would be the same in each of the four periods and equal to 1,000 euros. Is this feasible? Well, to afford it in the first period, you would need to borrow 500. This means that saving in the first period would be equal to minus 500. Next period, in 2020, income is now 1,500, but consumption is only 1,000. So savings would equal to plus 500, and the same for the next two periods. Does this satisfy the budget constraint? Well, to satisfy it with equality, assets must be zero at the end of the last period. 
This means that neither you spent too much, nor you left any resources behind. In the first period, you start with zero assets, but then borrowed 500. Hence, the asset position at the end of 2019 is minus 500. The next period you started with minus 500, but since you saved 500, the asset position is now zero. Rinse and repeat for 2021 and 2022, and we see that at the end of 2022, we neither spent too much or too little, as assets are zero. So what do we derive from this? Well, first the theory says that if you are allowed to use credit markets to borrow and lend, according to your possibilities, Consumption is equal to a long-run average of income. We call it permanent income. And credit markets are used to transform a noisy income process into a stable path of consumption. We call this consumption smoothing behavior. And this is at the core of practically all macroeconomic models that are used today. We will now look at things a bit more formally in the context of what we will describe as the life cycle model. In the 1950s, Franco Modigliani, another Nobel laureate for his work on the analysis of saving and financial markets, made the observation that people's saving behavior tended to have a life cycle component. People tended to borrow in their early years, pay off debt, and accumulate wealth until retirement. And then they save again in order to maintain stable consumption profiles. We will see why that happens in more detail. Assume agents derive utility from consumption, that is, that there exists a function u of consumption that maps the positive side of the real line to the real line, where the function is twice continuous differentiable. The first derivative is positive, which means more consumption always makes you happier, but the second derivative is negative, meaning that additional units of consumption in a given period will have decreasing returns. We will assume also that utility is additive, separable, and that agents have some degree of impatience. That is, they discount future utility at the ge geometric rate beta, raised to t. This means that lifetime utility of a given path of consumption is just equal to the discounted sum of the utility of each period's consumption. Assume also that agents are endowed each period with income WT, live for uppercase T periods, and can spend their income on consumption CT or saving for the next period AT plus one, on which they earn a per period gross return of capital uppercase R. The budget constraint is in any given period of the agent is then given by CT plus AT plus 1 equal to R times AT plus WT, or in other words, what you spend on consumption plus what you save for the next period must be financed by the assets you brought into the period accrued of the respective interest plus wage income. The optimization problem for the agent is then to choose how much to consume and save in each period, from zero to uppercase T, subject to this budget constraint. To solve this, we use the Lagrange theorem and set up the following Lagrangian function. The fact that the objective function is continuous, strictly concave, and the domain is compact ensures both existence and uniqueness of the solution. We need to take first-order conditions with respect to consumption, capital, and the Lagrange multiplier. Using the first and second equations, we get what we call the Euler equation, named after one of the most, if not the most, prominent mathematicians of all time, Leonard Euler. The equation states that optimal consumption behavior implies that the marginal utility of consumption at a given period must equate the product of the subjective and market discount rates times the marginal utility of consumption tomorrow. Suppose that agents' time preferences and the market discount rate 
cancel each other. Or in other words, beta times R is 1. Then it says that I have to choose consumption amounts such that an additional unit of consumption today gives the same additional utility as an additional unit of consumption tomorrow. Given that the utility function is monotone, more consumption means always more utility, then it follows that consumption today equals consumption tomorrow. This is precisely the result we looked at the beginning. If allowed, households will use credit markets in order to transform a variable income process into a smoother consumption schedule. As a side note, it is important to mention that this is only true in general if the Lagrange multiplier is strictly positive, which means that the budget constraint is binding in every period. The economic interpretation of a strictly positive multiplier is that the marginal utility of relaxing the budget constraint by one unit is always greater than zero. This is trivially satisfied by our assumption of a strictly concave utility function. We know that optimal behavior will imply equating the marginal utilities of consumption across time, corrected by the product of the subjective and market discount factors. But at what level? In order to solve for it, we need to use the budget constraint, solve it with respect to consumption, and substitute it in the Euler equation. This will give the following equation. This is a second order difference equation in assets. Given a path for wages, two conditions on assets and some functional form assumption on utility, we can solve for the entire path of assets and then back out consumption. Let's assume, without loss of generality, that agents enter the labor market with no wealth and leave no bequests. That is, that A0 is zero, and that AT plus one is also zero. How can we solve for this then? First, guess some value for A1. Second, since we now know A0 and guessed A1, we can compute the implied A2. Since we now know A1 and A2, we can get A3. You can keep repeating this until period t. Now we have AT minus one and AT, so we can get the implied A uppercase T plus one. Now, either A uppercase T plus one is zero, and our initial guess for A1 was correct, or it was not. If it was not, we need a new guess and repeat the process. In practice, the structure of this problem is such that it can be summarized as one equation in one unknown. Note also that we could also rewrite the sequence of budget constraints with only one equation. We call this consolidating the budget constraint. Start by noting that the budget constraint is written for an arbitrary t, and as such is valid for t equal to 1, t equal to 2, and so forth, up to t equal to uppercase t. If we solve the second equation with respect to a2 and substitute in the first, we get that c0 plus c1 over r minus w0 minus w1 over r plus a2 over r equals r times a0. If we solve the third equation with respect to a3 and keep iterating, we get the consolidated budget constraint. Recall our assumptions of no bequests and no initial wealth. And we get that the net present value of lifetime consumption must be equal to the net present value of lifetime wages. Let's go back to our particular case when beta times R is equal to one. As we saw before, since utility is strictly increasing in consumption, it must be that consumption is constant through the life cycle. Using this in our consolidated budget constraint shows that consumption depends only on the net present value of lifetime income. Any combination of different life cycle wages, as long as providing the same net present value, will lead to the same constant consumption. Agents borrow and lend in the credit markets 
to transform a potentially noisy income process into a smooth consumption profile. They can do this because of complete markets. They can borrow and save as much as they need. Here we have four examples of wage life cycle profiles that have the property that all have the same net present value. We use the constant relative risk aversion utility function, a coefficient of relative risk aversion sigma of 2, a subjective discount factor beta of 0.96, and a gross interest rate R of 1.03. Many things of note here. First, note that consumption is the same regardless of the timing of the wages. This follows directly from what we had just found. Consumption depends only on the net present value of lifetime wages and not on the timing per se. Second, note also that consumption is trending slightly upwards. This is consequence of the fact that beta times R is different from one and the value of the coefficient of relative risk aversion, sigma. Third, Note how much smoother consumption is relative to wages. It is the asset schedule that reflects the different wage profiles. This conforms to the idea that according to the permanent income hypothesis, households use credit markets to borrow and lend such that they are able to transform a noisy income process into a smooth consumption profile. Lastly, the life cycle age profile in the top left plot was taken from wage data for the US. We do observe that workers tend to earn less during their early years, increasing their earnings through their life cycle, where they typically top off at age 55 and decrease since. Remarkably, such a profile for wages implies precisely the asset profile we alluded at the beginning of this exposition when mentioning the facts that Modigliani was interested in studying, that households do borrow at early stages in life, pay off their debt, and accumulate wealth until retirement, and this save again in order to maintain a stable consumption profile.